This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! Get it before it goes into the Disney vault forever. The introduction of animation to Nickelodeon in 1984 had proved to be the right call. Not just in hindsight, as Nickelodeon would gain a reputation for animated programming, but there was an immediate boost in ratings with the introduction of Danger Mouse and Bell and Sebastian. So, in 1985, Nickelodeon tried to replicate that success. And I mean replicate quite literally. Nick introduced two animated shows that year, a Western-produced action-adventure series and a Japanese-produced adaptation of a work of French literature about a boy crossing the European countryside on foot and making many new friends on the way. This is Bell and Sebastian 2.0, aka The Adventures of the Little Prince. Meet a boy who seems like a regular kid. He likes to swim, play in the snow, and even the girls like him. Yeah. But he's no ordinary guy. I'm the little prince, and I just dropped down from outer space for a visit. His best friend is a space bird. Hi there, little buddy. Figured maybe we'd zing down to Earth today. He flies on comets. Yeah. And he's got a rose for a pet. I bring her lots of presents to make her happy and keep her comfortable. He's the little prince. Catch him every day on Nickelodeon. The titular Little Prince is a young boy who lives on the tiny planet known simply as B612. There he lives with three small volcanoes, two active, one not, a couple of flowers and butterflies, and a single rose, who is also a woman, whom the Little Prince loves very much. But then he meets a space-traveling bird named Swifty, who tells him about all sorts of interesting places across the universe. The little prince is intrigued, and so begins to take journeys across the stars by catching comets in his butterfly net. The little prince goes to many places, but his most common destination is Earth, where he meets all sorts of people with various problems. One boy wants to climb a very dangerous mountain in tribute to his late father. A giant man has trouble fitting into the community with his size and super strength. A dog's attempts to save a girl from drowning gets misunderstood, and now he's being hunted as a dangerous animal. It's up to the little prince to step in and try and fix things, but not before he struggles to make you believe he comes from another planet. He has to do this. All. The. Time. I fly all over space to lots of different planets. Are you an astronaut? I guess. Sort of. What's your name? I just came down from another planet, and I'm happy to meet a friend right away. It's better than anything I ever tasted on any planet. Are you a reindeer milkman? The Avengers of the Little Prince, as presented, we'll get to that in a bit, ran on Nickelodeon from May of 1985 to December of 1989, rotating through a total of 26 episodes. When the Nick Jr. programming block was introduced in 1988, it found a home there along with many of the other foreign animations Nick had picked up along the way. As it was one of those always-on shows during the channels gaining its first major wave of popularity, it seems pretty fondly remembered among 80s kids, but it was never a critical part of the channel's popularity. In fact, being on Nickelodeon is probably the least interesting thing about this show. The end of a weird and stupid game of adaptation hot potato. So let's take this all the way back to the beginning, to 1943 and the publication of the original book, the Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. In this French classic, an aviator crash lands in the Sahara Desert and has only eight days to fix his plane before he runs out of water. Soon after, however, a mysterious boy in fancy robes shows up and demands the pilot draw him a sheep. This is the Little Prince, and for the next eight days the pilot slowly coaxes out the boy's story, about his tiny planet B612 and his complicated relationship with his talking rose, about his journey across the stars, visiting other small planets with singular inhabitants before finally reaching Earth, where he spent a year wandering, meeting snakes and foxes and guys peddling magic pills. In the broad strokes, the book is about the divide between childhood and adulthood, how each perceive the world and value things differently, with the aviator being someone struggling with the two states of being. In the end, I'm sure to get certain more important details all wrong. But here, you'll have to forgive me. My friend never explained anything. Perhaps he thought I was like himself. But I, unfortunately, cannot see a sheep through the sides of a crate. I may be a little like the grown-ups. 
I must have grown old. As such, this is the kind of book that means something very different when you read it as a child versus reading it as an adult. You realize how much of the silly grown-up behaviors you've actually given into. The number crunching, the blind commitment to a job, the desperate attempts to save time. These are only necessary because we've built a culture in which they are necessary. As a kid, I was caught up in the fantastical imagery and silly logic of the story. But as an adult, I found it an incredibly somber story about losing your childhood. The book ends with the little prince, a symbol of how children see the world, committing suicide via snake bite. Within the childhood logic of the book, this is a magical ritual that'll send the little prince back to his home planet. But as an adult reader, or at least as this adult reader, there is a melancholy of things long lost. Outside of writing, Antoine had been a commercial pilot who had once crashed his plane in the Sahara Desert in 1935. This key event has resulted in a lot of autobiographical readings of the story. Many theorize that the relationship between the Little Prince and his Rose mirror saint Exupéry's difficult relationship with his wife, that the Little Prince was based off his nephew, and that the Little Prince's death reflects the death of his younger brother. At the time of this writing, there's a 2018 documentary on Netflix called Invisible Essence, The Little Prince that explores the parallels between the book and the author's life. It's worth a watch if you're interested in the book's complex themes. saint Exupéry became a military pilot during World War II, and on July 31st, 1944, he disappeared during a reconnaissance mission over occupied France. The wreckage of his plane wouldn't be discovered until 2000. In time, saint Exupéry would be considered a national hero in France, and the little prince, released after his disappearance everywhere except the United States, became a huge success around the world, translated into 300 languages, more than any other piece of non-religious text, and is now the third best-selling book of all time. Naturally, with that much presence, the book would be adapted into other mediums many, many, many times around the world. Puppet Theater in Germany in 1950, a radio play in Britain in 1953, a three-part symphony in the Soviet Union in 1964. The first film adaptation in 1966 was also Soviet, and it really leans into both the weirdness and the melancholy of the original text, though it does omit the famous fox scene. Gene Wilder played the fox in the 1974 English musical film produced by Paramount Pictures, arguably the most well-known theatrical adaptation, though I think the songs in it are kinda eh, and boy howdy did they love their fisheye lens. Do see it for Wilder, though, he's pretty great. It's only with the heart that one can see clearly. What's essential is invisible to the eye. The Little Prince was translated into Japanese in 1953, right after Allied forces ended their post-war occupation of the country. Now, The Little Prince probably would have reached the country anyway, but as discussed in the Bell and Sebastian episode, this was a time when a lot of Western media was filtering into the country and informed a lot of the media Japan would produce over the next couple of decades. The end result of which was a lot of what I've come to call Eurocentric anime. Japanese animated television shows based on European literature. The backbone of this movement being Nippon Animation's highly successful World Masterpiece Theater, beginning in 1969, with many competitors throwing their hats in the ring soon after. One such competitor managed to get the rights to the Little Prince, and they have a name after this show's own heart. Knack Productions. Knack Productions has one of those backstories that seems like it's building up to something epic. It was made up by former employees of Toei Animation and Mushi Productions, some pretty talented creators like illustrator Saichi Hayashi and director Tadeo Tsukioka. That seems exciting, like, like anime Moneyball. But in reality, Knack Productions was pretty B-tier. Their shows tended to be unexceptional trend chasers, mostly giant robot and superhero shows and the quality of their animation was, at best, nothing to write home about, and they were often not at their best. I didn't go through their entire library, but their 1974 action anime, Charge Men Ken, is full of stiff character movements, two or three frame animations, and misaligned animation cells and background plates. 
こしゃくら小僧め。Hey, yeah, he should be rolling on the ground, right? Not hovering over it? Eh, the kids aren't going to care. On July 4th, 1978, the TV SIE network premiered Knack Productions' attempt at a Eurocentric anime Hoshi no Ojisama Puchi Prince. Thirty nine episodes were produced, but only thirty five aired. The final four episodes not seen the light of day until the show was released on home video. I wouldn't call the animation in The Little Prince amazing, but it's probably cream of the crop as far as Knack Productions goes. There are moments where they clearly took their time to make it seem fluid and pretty, but there are also plenty of distracting animation shortcuts, wonky perspectives, and off model characters. Here's a good example. It's a scene where the little prince and a woman are having a conversation in the back of a moving cart. Watch the background. Yeah, they couldn't bother creating a Hanna Barbera style looping background for the scene, so instead they kept hard cutting the background over and over and over again. One of the show's key animators was Taiko Oda, who had only been in the industry for a year and a half by that point. Doing in between animation for shows like Lupin the Third. Key animation, in very simple terms, defines the beginning and end points of any smooth motion, dictating the important gestures and stances of an animated sequence, while in between animation is the busy work of animating between those points. In the animation industry, you typically have to spend years as an in betweener before getting promoted as a key animator. Oda's career trajectory was exceptionally fast and a point of contention for the people running Knack Productions. This isn't to point any level of blame at her for the animation mistakes within the series, but it does give you an idea of how the company ran things. Management at odds with each other, inexperienced animators taking over in lead positions. It's a bit of a mess. As an adaptation of The Little Prince, it jettisons a lot of the more fantastical elements of the book. Taking place entirely on Earth, we miss out on the parade of tiny planets occupied by caricatures of absurd grown up behavior. And the themes of childhood versus adulthood aren't really present. It's more about the little prince wandering Europe and solving problems with the power of friendship. The episode that probably taps into the book's themes the most is episode 19, Nostalgic Telescope, where a boy has a suitcase full of personal treasures, odds and ends that spark his imagination. But his parents don't understand this childlike behavior and try to get rid of the case by throwing it into a stream. The little prince and the boy track the case down and Oh, okay, this is, uh. This is unnecessary. I know different cultures have different attitudes towards. That was a penis! That was a little boy's penis! Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Certain images from the book are represented. The second episode features the aviator in the desert, but doesn't seem to recognize the importance of his character. The fox shows up, but more as a cameo. That episode is more about the little prince talking some other kid out of destroying rose bushes. There's an episode about a scientist discovering B612 and presenting his findings to the scientific community, but getting laughed out of the building because of his clothes. This is a small three paragraph story in the book, and the episode turns it into a comedy of errors as the little prince and the scientist's daughter try to force him to wear a suit. Yes, conform to the adult standards, said the little prince. It's important you're taken seriously. The best episode of the show is the first, introducing the little prince and his planet, a fun, fantastical image, though they took the talking rose and made her more, uh, lolly ish. The show aired in Japan through to the end of March 1979. 
Taiko Oda moved on to the big leagues with World Masterpiece Theater and is now an animation freelancer with over 40 years of experience. Knack Productions found a little more success in the 80s, most notably the volleyball show Attacker U in 1984, but in the 1990s the company pivoted away from television and toward original video animation, or OVAs. More specifically, hentai OVAs. Yes, they became a porn company. Which, you know, nothing wrong with that per se, but very far from the company's original intentions. But while their version of The Little Prince was flawed, it's not the version Nickelodeon would receive. Unlike Bell and Sebastian, which Nickelodeon did a surprisingly good job localizing themselves, The Adventure of the Little Prince was purchased pre-localized by a company called Jambre Productions in 1983. And they didn't do a great job. Let's start with a dub. It's gold, Wally. There's been a new strike. A big one. Gooch, I think you've been snake bit. <laughs> I heard it with my own ears. Huh, heard what? Two kids. One of them said his uncle told him there's a whole heap of gold right in that mountain. Ooh, please. Yeah, this is the kind of bad 80s English dub that gets an entire generation of anime fans to swear to subs, not dubs. Zero effort to match dialogue to lip movement, long awkward pauses, and none of it to serve a good script. Like, you can forgive some bad lip sync if the script is good, but no. Hello, Jacob. Well, I see you have a little friend. Some low waterfront urchin, no doubt. Ah! You said he was working on his lessons, Enos. There's a deal to be learned from the sea, Esther. Well, it's not the same kind of learning. This is the end of nowhere. I suspect there wasn't any attempt at a translation of the Japanese script, for reasons I'll get into in a bit. And through a lot of re-editing, many of the show's stories, and even the basic premise, is pretty different. In the original anime, we follow the little prince as he travels across Europe on foot, watching his year on Earth as described in the book. In the Jambre version, the Little Prince is frequently going to and returning from Earth, each episode starting with the prince on his little planet, grabbing a comet in a butterfly net, and never landing where he intends to. Of course, since the Little Prince only catched a comet once in the original anime, that means that this is all footage being recycled over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm not talking about how, like, Many anime will reuse transformation sequences. Most of these episodes have completely rewritten the dialogue for the same scene multiple times. This scene of Swifty and the Little Prince talking by the tree shows up in 12 episodes, each time with different dialogue. Did we land on Earth, Swifty? No, but it's a whole lot like it. You ought to meet some real interest in dudes here, buddy. Sounds good. (sighs) I know I like it. See any pyramids yet, Swifty? No. And you know what, little buddy? I think we landed in Scotland. Scotland? (sighs) Are you sure? Where's the ocean liner, Swifty? We gotta find the ocean first, little buddy. I figure it's around here someplace. You look. (sighs) You can fly. Is this Earth? Where's the snow? Well, we landed on a tropical island, but they celebrate Christmas here, too. Oh, good. (sighs) I'll miss the snow. All of this screams, eh, kids are stupid. They won't notice this. And I don't understand why they bothered to make this change. What was wrong with the original premise? Why does the little prince have to go back to his planet at the end of each episode? The original anime doesn't have the suicide by snake scene from the book, but it does make clear that returning to B612 will take time and effort. The Jambre version trivializes the journey. The only reason I could figure was that maybe, maybe, They thought Swifty the Bird was a marketable character, and this was a way of getting him into most of the episodes. He only shows up in two episodes of the anime. Now, this isn't any more of a faithful adaptation of the original book. In fact, the opening tells you this very directly, even more so than The Adventures of Black Beauties with acknowledgement to the classic. Points for being honest, I guess? 
But the Jambri version does have a few things the original anime didn't. For example, the little prince goes to planets besides Earth. Now you may be asking yourself, how did they accomplish this when there's no animation of the little prince going to other planets? Easy. They just say that, oh, over here there's this other planet that looks exactly like Earth, and it has the same flora and fauna as Earth, and these humans with their 1910s fashions and technologies have worked out interplanetary space travel and have settled on this planet in a way that's indistinguishable from a 1910s European village. You must be one of those aliens they never understand about money. Get the police! 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 I don't understand. You can't eat free! We're not that alien. Oh, bite me. This is just so insulting to the intelligence of the viewer. And they don't re-edit things so that these are weird alien stories. The plots are the same as the Earthbound plots from before. A guy looks for oil. A pregnant sheep goes into labor. A developer is trying to take over an old man's land. Putting this stuff on a quote-unquote other planet does nothing for the story but condescend and confuse. Hey, riddle me this, Batman. If this show takes place in some kind of intergalactic federation, why are people on Earth so befuddled when the little prince says he comes from another planet? Some of the changes made to these episodes were presumably made to make the show more, I don't know, family friendly? One episode, actually that same episode with the junkie background, tells the story of a chimney sweep who has a crush on a ballerina. But they come from two different worlds. They're of different classes. So the little prince tries to set them up. Well, romance is icky. So in the Jambre version, it's changed so that the chimney sweep is the ballerina's father. And he's embarrassed about his low station while his daughter has made it big. So it becomes a story about the little prince reuniting parent and child, except all the body language is from a story about a guy who has the hots for a girl. So of course it comes off as a father having the hots for his daughter. You might think me balmy, but that young lady is me daughter. I ain't seen since she loved the daisies when only a wee talk. Then you really ought to go and see her. You must be very proud. Are you ashamed to have her see your just a chimney sweep? Is that it, sir? Well, maybe. You wouldn't have to tell her who you are, but you'd get to see her up close and talk to her, and maybe even hold her hand for a minute. Well, I... <laughs> You can see how this makes the episode weird. The lamest change, in my opinion, comes from the Dancing Bear episode. Here the little prince meets a traveling act of an old man playing violin and his small bear who dances on a ball. Uh, the bear's name is Yuri in the Jambre version. During the night, a pack of wolves attack their camp and the bear gets mortally wounded, eventually dying. The man and the prince burying him in the morning. In the original Japanese version, the old man has little self-confidence. He believes the act was only successful because of the bear. And while he's grieving for his friend, he's also grieving for his career. The little prince goes to a nearby town and gathers children to hear the man play, giving him the confidence to go on. In the Jambri version... Oh my god! Okay, here we go. In the Jambri version... The little prince and the old man wake up in the morning to find Yuri missing and a freshly dug grave nearby. Ah, poor little Yuri is gone. How? We didn't see it. I don't know. Somehow, in the night, somebody come along and bury him. Poor Yuri. Better we don't see. Better somebody else do it. They assume somebody found a bear corpse in the middle of their camp took it without waking them up, and buried it for them. Okay, so, so, so the little prince is convinced that this is just some other random burial site, so he runs into town and comes back with news. The little prince was right. In his feverish condition, Yuri did wander away during the night. Some small boys found him and took him into the village where a doctor is taking care of him, and he will soon be well. Could be Yuri back? Yuri is well, he'll be back! Yuri is well, he'll be back! Yes, Yuri is alive! The bear is alive! We're not gonna show you him, but trust us, the bear lived. Like, okay, 
You don't want a dead pet in a kid's show because the Mr. Hooper is dead episode of Sesame Street hasn't aired yet, and you don't know you don't have to be a coward about death in a kid's show. So why bother with this episode at all? You guys only localized 26 episodes. There are 13 more you didn't touch that you could have picked from to replace it. Now, I couldn't find out much about Jean Brie Productions as a company. The only other work their name was attached to was as a co-producer for the 1987 film Alice Through the Looking Glass. However, many of the people in the English credits, including director Franklin Kofod, producer and screenwriter Jameson Brewer, and composer Dale Shacker, were all brought onto another localization project shortly after The Little Prince's completion. And this one's a bit more well known. From uncharted regions of the universe comes a legend. The legend of Voltron, defender of the universe. A mighty robot, loved by good, feared by evil. Yes, the adventures of the Little Prince and Voltron, defender of the universe, share most of the same creative staff. This is why I don't think Jean Brie even looked at the Japanese scripts for the Little Prince, as the people behind turning Beast King Go Lion into Voltron famously didn't look at the scripts either, just making up their own story and mythology as they went along. Jambri Productions originally released The Adventures of the Little Prince in 1983 to local networks before Nickelodeon picked it up in 1985. One of the things that might have made it more appealing to Nickelodeon was the endorsement from the National Education Association, which is odd because they're a teacher's union and have nothing to do with media. Is The Adventures of the Little Prince educational? No, it's it's not. It's just fl a flat no. But you know, the book wasn't educational either. Not being educational isn't a problem. But I would figure it'd be a requirement for an endorsement from a teacher's union. I suspect the main reason Nickelodeon picked the show up were the parallels between it and Belle and Sebastian. But Belle and Sebastian outclassed it in every way possible. Belle and Sebastian was better written, better animated, better localized, better dubbed, had things to say, and didn't disrespect its audience. These two shows weren't in the same league. And yet, The Adventures of the Little Prince has had far better presence in home video than Belle and Sebastian ever had. The 80s would see multiple VHS releases, as well as a release for the technological dead end that was the RCA Selectivision video disc. Woo! CED! Movies on vinyl! There have been two DVD releases with all 26 episodes of the American localization. They're both out of print and aren't cheap on the secondhand market, but they're not hard to find. You can even check them out through Netflix. Um, Netflix can also mail you DVDs. That's what they did before streaming. Yo, show of hands, who still has a Netflix DVD account? Just me? Okay. If you're interested in the original Japanese version, as of this writing, all 39 episodes are available through the streaming service Crunchyroll, complete with English subtitles. I don't believe it to be an exceptional anime, but after seeing how bad the localization got, watching the Japanese version felt like a breath of fresh air. It might not be the version you're nostalgic for, but it is the superior version. Now look, I don't go into these videos with the intent to ruin your childhood. I've talked to people who watch The Adventures of the Little Prince all the time, and I don't wish to take those childhood memories away from them, or from you. But I do think the localized version of this show was needlessly bizarre and insulting to the intelligence of its young demographic. There is a tragedy of the lost childhood in the book of The Little Prince, and fair warnings against the absurdities of grown-ups. And when grown-ups think they understand children, but don't, you end up with products like this. They're showing you an elephant swallowed by a snake and telling you it's a hat. But kids know better. Nick, 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 Next time, we go on a more proper space adventure with the crew of the Enterprise. Does Star Trek hold up in animated form? The answers might surprise you. Today's research shout-out goes back to the documentary Invisible Essence, The Little Prince. Little Prince is a dense topic, even before you get into the adaptations, and this film is a good primer in learning the relationship between it and its author. 
Also, a big thank you to Phosphorescent Skeleton on Twitter. She helped me with some translation work for this project, from which I learned that the original anime would get preempted by baseball games. It's the small details like that that really make this project. And a big thank you to all of you in YouTube land. If you like knickknacks and want to support it, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and apples. Granny Smith apples, mostly. You can also support Nick Knacks and the Paparina by subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, liking my videos, leaving comments, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through coffee, or sharing these videos with your friends and family. Tons of links in the description below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.